All right, so uh, welcome everybody to this first colloquium this semester, and we are very happy to have uh, Professor Sascha Quanz with us from the ETH uh, Zürich. I quickly introduce him. So he made his study of physics and get his PhD in, at the MPIA in Heidelberg. And then interestingly, he went to McKenzie, became a consultant for a time for two years in Frankfurt. But since then, he uh, is in at the ETH Zürich uh, with a very steep career. So he started as a postdoc and then became a research associate and then lecturer. And since 2019, is, he is an associate professor there with lots of teaching, as I heard. <laughs> and he is known to the community uh, not only for his science, but also for the instrumentation projects he is driving. So he was the PI of the LIFE mission, which is a candidate L mission, future L mission for ESA. Um, they, he attracted several grants also to do something for ELT Matis, which is also a mid-infrared uh, region. And he is also a co-I of the IRIS, a one to five micron uh, adaptive optic, optics imager spectrograph. That's a second generation VLT instrument. So Sasha is certainly an observer but also uh, very uh, firm in, in uh, more technical aspects of, of, of all of this beyond his science. Um, but we are uh, very happy to have him here. Today, he will talk mostly about the LIFE initiative. And yeah, up to you, Sasha, take it away. Thank you so much for this uh, very nice introduction, Peter. Uh, indeed, um, I, I'm gonna spend I think 99% of my of my talking time uh, to get you hopefully interested in the life initiative. I would I would hope that by the end of this uh, presentation you have an understanding what it is. That you also understand that this is something where we welcome contributions, participation. That this is not a closed club, and that uh, if those of you who are interested in exoplanetary science uh, or other science topics that require mid infrared, maybe this is something you would indeed uh, be interested in contributing to. Uh, LIFE stands for Large Interferometer for Exoplanets. This is the acronym we, we came up with. And as you see here from the subtitle, uh, the main science driver is the atmospheric characterization of terrestrial exoplanets in the mid-infrared. And we're going to do this with a large space-based modeling interferometer. Some of these terms may not be known to you, but I would like to, and hopefully it can motivate uh, all of these terms through uh, in the coming few few minutes. Let's, like, let's take a step back um, and, and look at the bigger picture of exoplanet, uh, exoplanet science. Uh, some people like to refer to this to the exoplanet revolution because basically uh, until 1995, we had some vague hopes that exoplanets might be abundant out there, uh, but it was the first detection of a exoplanet around a sun-like star that ultimately drove the, you know, this, this, this research field. And it did this quite successfully. By now we have more than 5,000 exoplanets uh, being detected with various techniques. Uh, and you see here a short summary uh, how the split uh, amongst those 5,000 exoplanets looks like if you, if you put it into different boxes, different kinds of, of exoplanets. You have gas giants, you have uh, super Earth planets, a planet type that we don't have in our solar system, some uh, in the size range between Earth and, uh, and Neptune, the Neptune-like planets and terrestrial planets. Uh, and you see also the fraction, how they split up. But what is very important to understand is that this is the fraction, how the known planets actually split up. And people managed to understand the systematic biases in those observations uh, from the technology side, but also from the search strategy, uh, strategy, uh, strategy side. And if you are able to correct for these biases, you can sort of get the real on the distribution of exoplanets, uh, exoplanets out there. So this is the observed one, but this does not reflect necessarily the true underlying population. If you were to do that, you would find that the terrestrial planets and the super Earth planets are the ones that are uh, the most frequent ones. And this is good news for those of you who are interested in understanding terrestrial exoplanets and also these super Earth planets, maybe because you're simply interested in the atmospheric composition, but maybe also because you're interested in understanding whether some of them actually provide conditions for for life to, uh, to occur. Today, most of these exoplanets were actually um, detected by so-called uh, indirect techniques. And uh, I guess most, most some of you have uh, know, know about these techniques. They're illustrated here on the top. You see the radio velocity technique where you use the star uh, and basically the wobble of the star that is introduced by an orbiting planet 
and using the Doppler shift in the lines um, of, the, of the stellar spectrum to identify that there's something orbiting the star. It's been the first technique that uh, got us many of the, of the plans we know today was the technique that was used for the discovery of the first exoplanets, but it's an indirect technique, right? Because you do not see the planet itself, you see the effect that the planet has on the, on the central star. And uh, let me see if I could go back and just start this again, sorry. And on the bottom, you see, uh, you see the other technique that is actually the most successful technique in detecting exoplanets is the transit technique. If you're lucky enough that the orbit of the planet is inclined so, so that it passes in front of the star, you see a dimming, a periodic dimming of the light. And this is how, for instance, the Kepler Space Telescope and currently the TESS mission, and in the future also the Plato mission, they will discover uh, more, more and more planets. And uh, it is the Kepler mission and the TESS mission today that really got us access to these small planets I was mentioning at the beginning, the small terrestrial planets, they were discovered uh, primarily through space-based space -based, uh, transiting, uh, uh, transiting exoplanet, exoplanet missions, simply because at this point in time, the radio velocity technique is not yet accurate enough to identify true Earth analogs around sun-like stars. The measurement is simply too hard. It's, the wobble is of 10 centimeters per second amplitude, and measuring the velocity of a star, you know, that is 10 parsecs away to that precision is at the moment at least not possible. So this is how we got to, to, to those numbers. There's other techniques, but more than 90% of the exoplanets were discovered in, in this way. So what do we do with them? Ultimately, I think there's three questions, at least from the terrestrial exoplanet perspective. And this is the exoplanet, this is the perspective I'm gonna take uh, for today's talk. We would like to understand the diversity of atmospheres uh, in our solar system. You basically have three types of atmospheres. You have hydrogen dominated atmospheres, you have CO2 dominated atmospheres, and you have nitrogen dominated atmospheres. And the question is, is there some systematic out there? You know, is there any law, any physics, any chemistry that is sort of dictating how atmosphere uh, formation and evolution should, should happen? And the sample is simply too small to, to answer that. The second question is then related to habitability. Do some of the planets actually provide conditions for, let's say, liquid water to exist? And ultimately, the question is, uh, do some of these planets show actually indications of biological activity in their atmospheres? So you could see this as a, if you want, like a three-step process. You know, you understand the diversity. Some of them may actually provide habitable conditions. And maybe some of those show actually indications of biological activity um, in, in their atmospheres. The challenge is that in order to do that, you need to get access to the atmospheres. And I was just mentioning to you that the techniques that were used are sort of indirect techniques. So you don't see the planet necessarily. Uh, however, you could use the, uh, the transit technique to get information about the atmosphere. And this is illustrated in this little movie. So uh, if you have a planet that has an atmosphere and you were not to observe it over certain wavelengths ranges. So not as, let's say, not a single uh, photometric channel, but you do a spectrum. And some molecules uh, do observe certain wavelengths ranges. And if you now observe at a certain wavelength range where a certain molecule observes, uh, absorbs, and this planet features this molecule in its atmosphere, the transit will look deeper because the planet appears larger as it passes in front of the star. So what you would get is you would get a wavelength dependent transit signal and knowing where which where and with what molecules do absorb, you can then piece together sort of the, the molecules that you can expect in, in this atmosphere. So transits do in principle allow you to also investigate the atmospheric properties of, of certain planets. And this is what is actually happening as we speak. If you want, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is the one uh, is one of the instruments that's going to revolutionize our understanding about exoplanet atmospheres using exactly this technique. And uh, you may also know about the aerial mission that is coming up uh, later of this decade, hopefully. And it will also do a systematic characterization of exoplanet atmospheres using this transit uh, technique. So using transit exoplanets and analyzing the light that passes, passes through the, the atmospheres. If you look a little bit more careful, however, you will see that those missions are focusing on warm and hot transiting planets. And most likely primarily big planets like hot Jupiters, hot Neptunes, neither of these missions will really be able to go down to the temperate regime, to the temperate rocky regime. And in the aerial uh, assessment study book, in the report, you actually find the statement that a long-term scientific vision 
is to characterize, uh, of course, a range of exoplanets, inclu including habitable ones. An aerial could be a pathfinder for future, even more ambitious campaigns. So acknowledging that Ariel is not going to do this, this, this kind of science. So it's not only that these missions will not be able to address some of the questions I was posing at the beginning, diversity of terrestrial temperate planets, habitability, biosignatures. So that's one thing. And the other very important aspect is to keep in mind that while everyone is focused so much on transiting planets today, this is because we can do it. Most planets do not transit. So for one transiting planet, on average, you have 99 planets that do not transit. So automatically you lose a lot of the population out there and uh, you basically tells you that you have to do something else than transiting, uh, than looking at transiting planets. The James Webb Space Telescope has a 6.5 meter aperture in space that is a gigantic telescope. But even with this machine, you know, we cannot do the transit spectroscopy uh, that we would like to do. So it tells you how hard it is. And it also tells you that probably it would make sense to sort of change strategy a little bit. And this brings us to another technique that has not been very successful at, at this point in time uh, because of te technological challenges, but where I believe this will be the technique in the future that will get us to answering the question that we are ultimately interested in. So here's a picture of a terrestrial planet. It's actually a real picture of our home planet Earth. And this is an image that some of you may know, it's called the uh, pale blue dot uh, image taken from the Voyager spacecraft on its way to the outskirts of, of the solar system. And if you're able to take a picture of a planet, so a direct measurement of the planet, you can then, of course, in principle, if you do it right, also take a spectrum of the planet. And this is gonna be key if you wanna address the atmospheric composition, if you wanna address questions of habitability, if you wanna address questions about biosignatures. So taking a direct spectrum of a directly imaged planet allows it to get access to, to, to its atmospheric composition, maybe even the temperature pressure profile and so on uh, directly. And this is illustrated here. You see your model spectrum of Earth, sort of an average spectrum that you would expect by averaging our different seasons, different human geometries and so on. You have on top, you have the optical, uh, UV optical and near infrared portion that is the reflected light roughly until you know 2.5 microns or so. And then if you go to longer wavelength, you see the thermal emission of the planet picking up and uh, you see also a plethora of absorption bands from some of the molecules you may be familiar with ranging from water to CO2 uh, to oxygen and gonna come back to some of them later. So it tells us that um, direct imaging is a good idea in principle. However, looking into the future uh, and making a current assessment uh, where we are today, uh, you can try to very you know, boldly try to understand how many planets you will get for future um, missions and or uh, instruments. And I tried to summarize it here. There's of course, lots of details one can debate, but for me, the principal takeaway message is the following, that with current telescopes, um, the direct detection characterization of terrestrial and, uh, exoplanets, you basically cannot do it. It's neither with the VLTs, 10 80 meter class telescopes, not gonna do it. James Webb is not going doing it. Then we're gonna hopefully have the ELT or the ELTs uh, being operational maybe in 10 years from now, uh, maybe a little bit earlier, depends a little bit of course on the, on the uh, funding situation in the coming years. We will get some, you know, the hope I believe is really that those gigantic ground-based 30 to 40 meter telescopes will be a first step. But at one point you will be limited by the earth atmosphere and all the challenges that it poses. So the long-term you have to go to space and you probably need to have a next generation flagship style mission where you really can do statistics, where you really can try to understand the systematics of exoplanet atmospheres in the temperate rocky regime and also look for those biosignatures and the habitability that, that, that I was mentioning. And you can see here two examples. This are, is the, the LUWAR and the HABEX concept. These were two mission concepts that has been studied by NASA and NASA last year announced that they identify a large reflected light mission as a potential next flagship mission. This will be a mission focusing in the optical near infrared where precisely this still has to be decided. And then down here, you see the life concept. So this is what uh, I will continue focusing on uh, uh, from now on. And this is a, this is a mid infrared mission. So it's basically reflected light up here and thermal infrared, mid infrared here with the, with the life initiative. So the vision that we have is to re try to develop the scientific context, the technology and the roadmap for such an ambitious 
space mission that allows us to investigate the atmospheric properties of at least you know, 30 to 50 terrestrial exoplanets somewhere close to the habitable zone around their stars. The habitable zone being that range, uh, that, range of, uh, uh, that distance from the star where assuming an Earth-like atmosphere, liquid water could exist on, on, on the surface. Also, this is a term one can debate for a long time, whether this is the right approach. Uh, with Earth being a habitable planet and even being inhabited, we believe it's not a bad starting point, but of course the details can be, uh, can be, can be debated and, and, and discussed. And as I said at the beginning, the vision is really to investigate the diversity of these bodies, understand some of them, if some of them are habitable, and potentially look for biosignatures in the exoplanet atmospheres. And the reason why we believe the mid-infrared is not a bad regime is, is the following. You try to summarize this on this very boring slide. I'm sorry for the, for the, for the, for the text heavy slide here, but it's something that we discovered is important to, to convey to, to audiences whenever we give presentations about the life initiative. It makes a huge difference if you, uh, if you look at a planet in reflected light or if you measure its intrinsic thermal emission because the thermal emission directly gives you access access to the pressure temperature structure much more accurately because all the mission goes through the full, the full atmosphere. And this is of course a key driver or key diagnostic for the chemistry and the climate of these planets. Also the mid infrared provides access to absorption bands of multiple major molecules, water, CO2, CO, but also in principle collision induced absorption of N2 or O2. So this really allows you to understand the, 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 the atmospheric conditions. You are much less affected by the presence of clouds. There are some effects, but it's less than we believe that in optical wavelengths, for instance, and you have access to numerous atmospheric biosignatures. For instance, all the oxygen in our atmosphere is coming from the plants. You don't have oxygen, molecular oxygen in the mid infrared, but you have a photochemical byproduct, which is ozone in our atmosphere. There's uh, methane bands, there's also nitrous oxide band, there's phosphine, uh, there's many other um, molecules that people are currently trying to investigate in closer detail, which of them are potentially good biosignatures in the sense that they are primarily produced by biological activity or side product of biological activity and that uh, potential false positives are sort of well, well understood. Uh, but whatever molecule you take, chances are that it has some uh, strong absorption features in, in the mid-infrared. And finally, and this is not to be, um, uh, it's not to be ignored, is that when you measure the thermal emission of the planet and you know the distance to the object, and we do it because we're, taking, we're talking here really about you know, a volume around the, or the sun from maybe 50, maybe 20 parsecs. So all the stars that we're gonna look at, they are known. So we know the distance and we measure the temperature and you measure the total flux you can get constrained on the radius of the object. And in particular, if you're interested in small rocky planets, you would like to know how large this object is. And in reflected light, you have a degeneracy between the size of the object and its albedo. So there's a challenge that it's very difficult to break and probing the thermal emission, it's, it's, it's much, much, much easier. So this is what led us to, um, to uh, really focus on this wavelength range. Um, and uh, here's an example, um, or to illustrate this a little bit further, you see here's thermal emission spectra of Earth, of Venus, and of Mars. Uh, you can see here some of the uh, absorption features I was already showing uh, uh, on, on a previous slide, um, that you can not only see that all these plants are peaking around uh, throughout this wavelength range that we're considering, but they also have strong absorption features. And very importantly, if you're interested in the question of, um, of uh, biosignatures, there is a band of methane right here. Uh, there is an oxygen, a strong ozone band here, and you also have nitrous oxide. That's also hidden in shorter wavelengths, but these are potentially uh, uh, wavelengths ranges you, you would like to, to probe if uh, atmospheric biosignatures are something you're interested in. So far so good. So how would we do it? Um, because I argued for a large space mission. So um, how, would it, how would it look like? And, it would look like the following. It's um, what we would call a space-based formation flying mid-infrared interferometer. You would have the exact number still to be D, I'm sorry. Um, a number of uh, collector spacecraft for the time being, we're operating with four spacecraft that send the light, that look at the same planetary uh, system and send the light to a central beam combiner uh, spacecraft that where all the magic is, is happening. And what the magic is, they're gonna uh, tell, you, tell you in a second. 
Um, and they are separated by 10 to hundreds of meters. And this is needed uh, because you need to uh, provide sufficient spatial resolution. The planets and the stars are relatively close together in the plane of the sky. So you have to be able to separate them spatially. And this requires a certain, a certain baseline, as, as, as we call it. And because we cannot put uh, a 40 or 100 meter telescope into space, we have to work with an interferometer. The reason to go into space is actually, as I already said, from the ground, even with the ELTs, we will be limited by the atmosphere. We will be limited at mid-infrared wavelength, in particular by the thermal background emission. The atmosphere has a certain temperature, the telescope has a certain temperature, and all of this influences your measurements. And it disturbs, it disturbs this measurement. So you have to go out of space in order to provide sufficient sensitivity to really find these very faint signals of these, these rocky planets. And just to give you a feeling for the fluxes, so if you have an Earth twin planet at 10 parsec and you observe at 10 micron where the peak emission is, it's of order a few photons per second per square meter that arrives at the telescope. So it's really, really faint. And that gives you a little bit of feeling for the challenge that we're having. Uh, I already argued for the wavelength range, maybe three to 20, four to 18.5 microns. And it will be spectral, uh, certain spectral resolution will be required in order to identify those different molecular bands. For the time being, we assume it's of order 50, but as we continue with our studies, maybe this number will be refined. But at the moment, uh, given the faintness of the signal, it's gonna be very difficult to argue for a high resolution spectrograph and maybe it's not necessary. So this is the basic principle. So how do we get rid of the central star? Because you still have to get rid of the central star because the planets are so faint and the stars are so bright. We talk here about 10 to the seven, 10 to the eight flux difference between the planet and the star. And this is already shown here on the, on the right-hand side, but let me start here in the, on the left-hand uh, on, on left side, um, why we need to have this nulling interferometer. I told you why we have to go to space. I told you why we have to have an interferometer with different apertures flying information because you cannot do it with a single telescope. It's gonna to be too large. But what does nulling mean? Nulling means that we're gonna kill the light from the central star. If you have now two apertures, let's start, start with two. The principle with four is, is, is the same. And if you were to observe one star in a planet um, with, with these two apertures, and you make sure that the light path from the light of the star is exactly the same through both apertures, then, and if you were to interfere these two beams, you would have a positive interference, right? Because as you're overlaying the two beams perfectly and it will uh, constructively interfere. Now, in nulling interferometry, you do a little trick because you would introduce uh, half a wavelength, a pi phase shift in one of the arms, and then you would overlay the beams. So what this will do is you go from positive to negative to destructive interference for light coming from the central star. And this is shown down here. So basically you would, generate a destructive fringe, a null, where the light of the star is coming from. But any light from the planet, it will go through the same system and it will also experience this phase shift here, but because it already has some phase difference between the two arms, because it's offset from the planet, some light can go through the system. And this is how you effectively can cancel light from the star and let light from the planet through. Now, of course, it depends where the planet is exactly, right? You may be unlucky, and this is why you would then start to rotating your array. You would start to modulate the signal to make sure that while the planet, the star rests in this dark fringe, the planet makes a certain path through this interference pattern that sometimes it's positive, sometimes negative, but it's this variation that you actually try to measure uh, a modulated signal uh, given the fringe pattern that you project on the plane of the sky. So this is how it works. And on the right-hand side, you see what is sort of required from a technical perspective. You would probably have to achieve a suppression factor of 10 to the five. So the star has to be reduced by a factor of 10 to the minus five. This is the minimum null depth as we call it for the central star. Then you can play some tricks with the modulation, how you actually do, uh, do the, the, the observations uh, exactly. You get another factor of hundred. And then through clever signal processing these days, you can maybe get another factor of 10 and then you're really down here at the planet signal and planet noise level. So this is what you have to achieve. It's a combination of the spatial resolution and this flux suppression. Some of you have been around for longer and know that this is not the first time people talk about a mid-infrared space-based interferometer. There have been studies uh, done at ESA and also at NASA site 15, 20 years ago. And uh, the original paper dates back to 1978 already. So there was um, a very famous paper by Bracewell 
where he was already speculating how to detect non-solar planets by a spinning infrared, infrared interferometer. And that was picked up after the detection of the first exoplanets and uh, ESA and NASA went and did quite significant, invested quite significant money into concept studies for these kind of missions. And then they got canceled. They got canceled, I think, for two reasons. And this is very important in the context of a life initiative. They got canceled because back then, that was the beginning of the, uh, in the early 2000s, we didn't know anything about exoplanets. We knew they were there, but we had no statistics. The statistics I showed you at the very beginning that we have every star is basically hosting a planet. Most of the planets are small in size. We had no idea about. So it was very difficult to quantify the scientific outcome of these, uh, of, of these missions. And there were significant technological challenges, some of which I believe we really start to master uh, as, we, as we speak. And this is why from within the LIFE initiative, we really felt it's time to re-propose this concept and give it a new look, a fresh look with 2020 eyes and not with 2000 eyes. And this is what, we are, what we're doing currently. So if you look at the, at the, at the literature, uh, we started to uh, generate, uh, I would say some, uh, some interest in the community by publishing some papers that try to explain why we believe this mission is, is, is a great idea. It goes from scientific papers. I'm gonna dive into some of them uh, in, in some more detail. How many plants can you actually detect? How does the simulation work? How, what could you actually uh, sec, uh, extract from, uh, from such a measurement, including the simulator? has been published, then to uh, looking at Earth analog planet, uh, twin Earth planets, looking at phosphine as a potential biosignature, looking at new concepts that were not thought of in the context of Darwin and TPFI. Uh, for instance, this, this is down here. Um, so it's a series of papers that we try to, uh, to put out there for people to get interested and to also understand what such a mission could do. I would like to take the next few minutes to walk you through some of the results, not all of them, but I would encourage you to have a look at the, uh, at the archive into, if you're interested or get back to me, uh, happy to discuss any of this in greater detail if you're interested. So a first very important question is how many planets would a mission like life be able to detect and why is this important? Because we believe that given the challenges that those indirect techniques are facing, we probably do not have a complete target list that we can simply go and characterize the planets using spectroscopy. Probably there has to be a phase where you first have to look and search for the best candidates. And then in the second phase of the mission, you would do in detailed characterization. It would be great if radio velocity could give us access to all the terrestrial smallish planets in the solar neighborhood, but we don't think this will happen. And this is why we did some simulations. How many planets we gonna, we gonna get? This is a busy slide and you don't have to worry too much about the details. It is simulating the search phase. We would say it's a two and a half year search phase. We take the, all the stars within Pony Parsec that are sort of single stars that uh, are not, not brown dwarfs. And then we use the statistics that Kepler mission gave us and you populate the nearby stars with this, with this exoplanet population and assuming some instrument model, we then calculate uh, how many planets of what kind could we actually detect. And you see here on the right-hand side, the two bars that, uh, tells you the total number of planets. So it's of order 500 or 300, depending on what kind of number you're mostly interested in. So we have two scenarios here. Scenario one is try to maximize all the planets. And scenario two is maximizing the number of uh, small terrestrial planets in the habitable zone. And because they are faint and difficult to detect, the total number decreases. And the color code tells you what kind of planet you're looking at. Rocky planets, super Earth, Neptunes, and sub -Strovians. So we really talk about dozens of smallish planets and literally hundreds of planets overall. And for comparison, we have here, those missions I was referring to at the beginning, missions that have been studied on the NASA side, the LUVAR concept, there's two different sizes for this uh, reflected light telescope, the HABEX concept that's significantly smaller. And you see those numbers are comparable, if not larger to those reflected light missions. And certainly some of these plants could be detectable by both missions. There is some overlap. And wouldn't that be fantastic that you have reflected light information and thermal emission uh, information from these, from, from these planets. So this is basically to show that within reasonable assumptions for the instrument, as we would see it, you can have access to, to literally dozens, if not hundreds of planets. And you can even split this up even further. The scenario one here is again, maximizing the total number of planets. Scenario two is maximizing the habitable zone planets, you can split it up into rocky habitable zone planets, 
Here's of order 30, here's of order 40, exo Earth candidates. So this is even a more defined class of planets, even more similar to Earth than the rocky habitable zone planets. And again, a split between rocky super Earth, sub Neptune, sub Jovians, and here hot warm cold that corresponds to certain separation ranges. This tells you that in principle, you have access to a variety of, um, of, of exoplanet parameters. Um, if you're interested in diversity, maybe this is what, what you want. I just see that these slides here is corrupted. I don't know why, so I'm gonna skip over it. Uh, and it's not, a, not so bad because the, the second slide here is showing exactly the same underlying plot, but not the punchline plot, um, uh, but in, in the punchline as well. Um, you see here in the background uh, uh, a graph that was uh, done and uh, put in a recent review paper where um, Robin Woodsworth and Laura Kreitberg, they tried to map out different areas of, of planets. Here's the radius. So this is one Earth radius. And here down is the equilibrium temperature. And if you go to higher and higher temperatures, you know, maybe you, uh, you expect certain uh, types of atmospheres no longer to exist. Or if you could put it differently, if you go to colder temperatures, maybe certain uh, atmospheres are only able to exist. And you can see here which ones these are. You have noble, noble gases right here. You have N2, CH4, CO uh, dominated here. So you see here different kinds of planets that maybe of first principle you would sort of expect to uh, expect to have. And this line here, this is the, the, the line dividing the, the, the rocky planets from the gas dominated planet. So everything above roughly 1.5 Earth radii is supposed to be hydrogen dominated. And here you see little crosses with names. And these are all known exoplanets. And these are all the known smallish exoplanets that James Webb is going to do. Those are already known. These are the transiting ones. It's very, very unlikely that any additional planet will come on top. So you can count them. Most of them come from a single system from the famous Trappist system, but you can count them and basically one, two, two, two hands. And overplotted here in contours, you see what the discovery space of life is. This is the 340 planets that I showed you in one of the previous slides. This is how they are distributed across this diagram. And they nicely cut into Venus and Earth-like planets. They nicely cut into the more hydrogen-dominated planets up here. So, and then you don't talk 10, but you talk 350 of order. And I think this is really literally a completely new discovery space that we have here. From the search phase directly, you already get information about uh, not only where the planets are, uh, but you also get already information about the temperature because you measure the thermal emission. You get information about the radius and you get the information about the separation. And they are very important if you wanna prioritize targets for follow-up. And we did some tests for the small plants in the habitable zone. We're gonna get the radius probably to with an error of 20% directly from the search phase. The temperature probably to an, uh, to an uncertainty of 10% or so, the effective temperature of the planet and the separation down to one or 2%. And this really helps you to then follow up those most interesting plants in greater detail. To go from detection to characterization, we did some what we call Earth retrieval studies. And we focused on an Earth twin to begin with. This is not to claim that we're gonna detect Earth twins, but this is a good starting point. And the way it works, we have an input spectrum uh, containing, uh, using a radio transfer model, uh, containing all the major molecules of Earth that, that I described at the, at the beginning. And then we have a different uh, a grid of different spectral resolutions, different wavelengths ranges. And then we put it through our simulator, adding different noise terms to it, and also giving it different uh, signal to noise ratios. In principle, um, simulating different observing, observing strategies or integration times. And then we're gonna ask the question, having this noisy spectrum, how well can we actually retrieve information about the planet such as the atmospheric composition, the radius, the temperature, and so on and so on. And this we do for the experts here using a, 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 an atmospheric retrieval framework. Here are some uh, examples for input spectrum. You see a low quality input spectrum here on the left-hand side, relatively low spectral resolution, low SNR, and a very high quality spectrum on the, on the right-hand side. Um, the shaded areas indicate the noise. Um, you, the the red, uh, red curve gives you the, the spectrum and you have a high, resolu high resolution spectrum in the background to, to see um, the lines more, more nicely. And here on top, you see in principle, the absorption bands of, of the molecules that we have. So this is for an Earth twin, Earth twin exoplanets. And then we can ask the question under what conditions, under what spectral resolution, what SNR, what wavelength range, we can obtain information about the composition with a particular focus on oxygen and methane, and this is 
this is shown here on the on the on the top you you see on the top the top uh, two rows are for the thermal emission for the life uh, simulations and down here we took some values that we found in the literature for reflected light and each column corresponds to a certain molecule so you have water you have here uh, ozone you have molecular oxygen co2 methane the radius of the planet the ground pressure of the atmosphere and the temperature on the ground because as I told you, from this measurement, you can in principle probe the PT structure of the atmosphere very well. And you can see very nicely that uh, the thermal infrared provides you more information overall, and in most cases also more accurate information than the re reflected light. And this again is very important if you're really interested in atmospheric characterization. However, there is of course information that is not accessible. I mentioned already molecular oxygen. This, this is something you could use in reflected light but not in, in thermal emission. And maybe I should say that the crown truth of all these molecules, the abundance is the, the black line here. And then you see some uncertainty here, left and right. This corresponds to uh, two decks or four decks. And the colored points are the value that we retrieve after our stimulated observation, how well we can actually measure the abundance of, of certain molecules. There's not perfect, but we have to keep in mind that this is a terrestrial planet 10 parsecs away, something that we cannot observe at all at all today. This is just a sort of a, a shout out that we also looked into different terrestrial uh, planet cases. This is not only the modern earth, but we also looked uh, in, uh, in an example earth through time. You can see here in the top panel that the atmospheric composition of course changed over the time of the earth evolution. And we wanted to understand if depending on, you know, when you were to observe earth, can you still decipher the different atmospheric compositions? Again, with a particular focus on methane, which was much higher in earlier times, and then it decreased, and oxygen, which was much lower, in particular before the great oxidation event, and then arriving at modern levels, modern levels here. And uh, we did a very similar approach, having different SNRs, different spectral resolutions, different wavelength ranges for us to understand what sort of spectral resolution and wavelength range such a mission should actually provide in order to do these kind of science cases. And here's just one example of, a, of, a, of, of, of one of our studies where we can, we actually showed that oxygen or ozone and CH4, we can detect um, over most of Earth history when they were at a significant, significant level. So whenever was, methane was relatively high, we would see methane. Whenever oxygen was relatively high, we would see ozone as a proxy for, for the molecular oxygen in, in the atmosphere. And if you were to put this together, because both of these tracers were coming from biological activity on this planet, we could probably not only differentiate between these two epochs, but we could also have access to these biosignatures for at least half of the Earth lifetime. So for almost 2 billion years, a mission like life could have identified biological activity on a planet like Earth, um, which I think is very, very promising. With this, I would like to switch to one slide of technology. I just want to give you a flavor for the kind of scientific questions we have been addressing so far. They were really driven by the exoplanet science. And before I started the presentation, I was chatting with Peter already. Of course, a space infrared, a space-based mid-infrared interferometer can also serve other science questions. Anything that has a certain temperature in the mid-infrared is of interest. And some people typically say the mid-infrared regime is for the dusty universe. So AGNs, circumstellar disks, evolved stars, we believe that there are strong science cases for such a mission uh, also in these, re these ranges. We didn't really start quantifying this. So this is certainly an area where you know, more support, more interest is needed. Um, but this exoplanet science is probably the one that's going to drive the mission in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the coming years. And this is why we, we started there. A word on technology. And um, maybe some of you are interested in those questions. How would you actually realize such a thing? And I want to mention four aspects. There's much more to discuss, but I don't think I have the time to do this here. So one question is that we have to demonstrate this null measuring principle. It's very easy to say you've, you shift the wavelengths in one arm by half a, by half a wavelength by pi. You have to do this achromatically. You have to do this in space. You have to do this over broad wavelengths range. How would you actually do this? And probably it has to be cryogenic. Um, so we started uh, being inspired by experiments that were done at JPL and in Europe um, in the context of Darwin and, and, and TPFI, the, the missions from the early 2000s. Inspired by these experiments, we started lab activity here at, at ETH to uh, rebuild those experiments, but then having in mind also the next step. Um, and this is to do these measurements 
not only in a lab environment, but already under cryogenic conditions with components that would in principle allow you to, uh, would be allowed also to, to be put on the spacecraft. And this has not been, not been demonstrated yet. So doing this nulling under realistic conditions is one of the goals we have here in our, in our lab. Photonics is a very important um, uh, part of the story at this point in time. Our labs, lab setup and most, uh, most ideas in the past, they were based on bulk optics. You have mirrors, you have phase shifters, uh, and this is a gigantic uh, optical table with all the control loops uh, that you need, to, cons uh, that you need to, to stabilize the amplitude and the phase of the beams and the polarization. Um, these days, many things related to high precision measurements are going from bulk optics into, uh, into, into photonics. So where you basically shrink your optical table to a small photonic chip. This is very successful in the near infrared already with many applications in ground-based telescopes. It's much less matured and advanced at mid-infrared wavelength because it's more tricky in terms of materials, but there's first uh, attempts to go in this direction. Different groups are investing, including also here at ETH, we have an initiative that really try to understand how much of this optical table we could shrink into a small photonic chips. Actually, you can do these beam combinations. You could do on a chip much, much, much easier. And the ultimate dream would be that you shrink your, your optical, your experiment in the beam combiner spacecraft from something that is like the size of a washing machine to something that's maybe the size of a, like, you know, a shoebox or something. A big headache, uh, admittedly, is in detectors. All the detectors that we have, the mid-infrared mid -infrared right now, are not good enough. I mentioned how, how, how faint the flux levels or how faint the signals are from those plants we're interested in. And uh, this is a big, big challenge because the noise levels, readout noise, uh, dark noise, this is, is, it's not good enough. The James Webb detectors are not good enough. And many of the detector developments were, were actually stopped. Um, so we have to check what technology, what detector type could actually deliver the requirements we have. And there's new ideas, uh, so-called M-kit detectors that might may be a solution. They actually are also uh, energy resolving, so you get a spectrum automatically. Um, this is something of uh, we, we really try to team up with uh, expert teams all around the world to, to understand what a valuable solution could be. And finally, you have those spacecraft in space, flying information, making this very precise measurements. Someone's going to control those spacecraft or not, right? They should be autonomous. And this is something that has to be demonstrated. Uh, it's something that we sort of watch from the side at this point in time, because there is a, a number of uh, space missions currently line, lining up to demonstrate high precision formation flying. Uh, it's not only the European Space Agency, there's a, the Proba 3 mission that hopefully launches maybe end of next year that will do this kind of demonstration uh, with two spacecraft that's already on, on the line. Uh, but also other uh, other agencies like JAXA are looking into this, not only for mid-infrared mid -infrared interferometry for exoplanets, but also for gravitational wave detectors, for instance. So there's a lot of push in this direction. This is something that we as an initiative, just watching from the side, hoping that some of the technologies being developed in the context here are actually useful also for life. And with this, I'm close to the end, uh, but I would like to make one important point. And I also mentioned this to, to Peter at the very, very, very beginning. I would like to go back one step and put life, the initiative into, in, in an international context. So if you think again about detecting and characterizing rocky exoplanets, um, you really want to do this from space in the long run. And one way of thinking about it, you can again think about reflected light and thermal emission, and you can think about solar type stars and M type stars. I didn't really talk about you know, the differences here so much uh, on this from a scientific perspective. But if this is the parameter space you're interested in, detecting characterizing exoplanets, you can ask the question, which instrument is gonna give you um, planets in, that, in one of these boxes here? And it turns out that for M stars and reflected light, you could probably do this from the ground. So maybe this is an ELT science case because the M stars, they are relatively faint compared to the solar type stars. So the contrast, between the star and the planet is not so bad compared to solar type stars. And maybe you can get this contrast with ground-based telescopes. And uh, you need a large telescope in order to differentiate the signal from the planet from the star. You need a large aperture to space resolve the planet, right? Again, it's about the direct detection. And this you probably cannot do with a smallish uh, space, uh, space telescope. So this leaves automatically the reflected light uh, planets uh, around solar type stars for this future NASA flagship. This is gonna be a something meter telescope, maybe four, maybe five, maybe six. 
It's too small to detect small planets around M stars, but it's going to be very stable and highly optimized to compensate for the high contrast that uh, a solar type star would, would actually uh, provide relative to, 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 a, to a terrestrial planet. And then the whole thermal emission, this is really life territory. And I think this is very important to keep in mind. Our simulations tell us that we would have access to M stars planets, to solar type planets, and nicely complementing all these, these activities here on the left-hand side. And with this in mind, we were very happy to, to read that last year in the context of ESOS YH 2050 process, um, life, I would say it's sort of identified as a, as a, as a candidate for a future L-class A-class mission, as Peter was saying at the very beginning. It's not mentioning this mission or this initiative with, it, with its name, but in this report, if you, if you read it carefully, and this is a report provided uh, put together by an interdisciplinary um, panel and handed over to the science director of ESA. It clearly says uh, atmosphere of tempered exoplanets in the infrared should be a top priority for ESA. It would solidify its leadership on exoplanet science and detecting, measuring these spectra would be an outstanding breakthrough that could lead yet again to another pay, uh, paradigm shifting discovery. So I think the scientific importance has been clearly identified and it's written in this report. And this is why I believe as a European exoplanet community or astrophysics community, we should leverage and try to you know, push for this, for this option as long as we can. In particular, because if you look at the current roadmap of exoplanet missions or space missions in general, it doesn't look too good for any alternative. And what I mean by this is, is shown here. So we have James Webb, we have Cheops, we have Plato, we have Ariel. They are already, th th this will happen. And then between the 2030s and the 2040s, there is the F2 mission coming up and an M7 mission probably coming up. The calls are already closed and there's no exoplanet mission candidate in this, nothing. And then you're already here in the regime of YH 2050, you have F-class missions here, but these are small missions. This is not gonna you know, be better than Ariel or Cheops or Plato at all. And then you're already talking about the, the L2, uh, sorry, the L5 opportunity where life is currently, I would say, candidate. So basically, if, you know, if it's not gonna be life or a mission like life, then it's gonna be very difficult for any significant exoplanet space mission in Europe for the decades, for all of the people currently working here and also the next generation, then we're done in Europe. Then we can hope that we can contribute to NASA, but this will not be anything European led uh, for the foreseeable future. And with this, I would like to invite you to join the initiative. As I said, it's really open for contributions. There's no closed club. We try to get a little more organized also with the, on the political side to make sure we have you know, connections to all major, uh, to all major um, ESA countries. One of the reasons I'm very happy to give this presentation here virtually in, in, in Austria. But if you're interested in the science, if you're interested in certain technology, technological aspects, please feel free to reach out. Let me know, get in touch. I'm happy to explain some of the details to, to any of you. And I believe if we work together uh, in Europe, we have a chance of making making this happen and, and, and complementing the flagship activities uh, at, at, at NASA site. And uh, I believe it would be a fantastic opportunity to have a reflected light mission and a thermal infrared mission jointly together between Americans, Europeans, and the whole world to investigate small terrestrial exoplanets and looking for signatures of life out there. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Sasha, for this uh, nice talk, really, and also keeping so so good to time and your beautiful introduction, I think, so very basic uh, explanations also for the technical challenges, etc. So thank you very much. Um, so do we have any questions? Please then raise your hand. So we have Luca. Hello, Sasha. Hi. Ciao, Ciao Luca. Good to see you. Uh, thank you very much for the for the great presentation. I have uh, I have a question. It's a it's a programmatic question essentially. Uh, as you as you know, getting uh, getting to find uh, habitable planets out there is essentially a statistics game. Uh, if we observe 10 and we find two, we know the answer. If we observe 10 and we find none, we don't know the answer. 
Um, so having so having two missions, life and uh, Louvoir or Habex or whatever it's gonna be called, um, at the same time it's gonna be the the, the rich man world, and uh, I I fear it's gonna be the, too much. I don't know if it, if it if it's gonna happen or not. Um, what what would you say if uh, if if not both of them could be done, but one of them could be done? And joining forces would then imply getting something better and bigger that would then increase statistics. Okay, <laughs> it's a multi-dimensional going. Point. Yeah, yeah. I, no, well, I, I, okay. I, I have, yeah, I see where you're going. Um, I think asking that question is somewhat too late because NASA decided what they're going to do. No one's going to change, you know, what the decadal, they, they are all on this road. So the reflected light mission, the flagship led by NASA will happen. I also know that Europe, ESA already put aside a certain number uh, of, of euros, significant number of euros to participate in that. This is outside of those missions that I was mentioning. So there's a, you know, there's a chunk of money that will be they devoted to participating in the next NASA flagship, which makes total sense. Europe did this in the past, so we should also continue doing that. For me, the question is a different one. Uh, and by the way, there's interest from NASA and JPL in life. So we have a workshop at JPL in the end of the year. So there's people who believe that actually, and this is now my personal uh, assessment, this mission, if you had to pick one, you should do this from the exoplanet perspective, because the information content is so much larger than in the reflected light. But again, this is this we cannot debate because NASA will do the other thing. The real question for me is, do we in Europe uh, believe that we should be pushing for this or are we fine with simply sending money over to NASA? This is not meant as a criticism, but for me, it's a question of how ambitious are we? And I know it's going to be expensive. You know it's going to be expensive. But the question is, is it always good enough just to send money over? Or do we claim some leadership in some areas? And I believe in this particular case, it is clearly that this is complementing each other. You could think of synergies that I didn't discuss, right? Where these two missions combined would be much, much, much more useful than any single one or in a half of a thing. It's, it's, there are many things how you can leverage the synergies. So I believe with the current, th how, how things are standing currently with this report we have, if we want, if we in Europe are interested in this question of habitable or inhabited planets, we should use that and leverage this and also challenge a little bit the way ESA is operating at this point in time. If you look at the programmatics, you mentioned programmatics, N NASA has flagships, NASA has, has probe missions, the envelope is of order or larger of an L class. So in principle, NASA could do whatever they want and we will always be late. I'm not talking about competition, but I'm talking about a little bit, you know, what is the attitude we should have in Europe? And this is a debate we, we, we can have. I'm willing to push as long as I can to, I was to actually, make this I was actually thinking the other way around. Um, you know, an L-class mission at, at ESA costs uh, a lot less than a flagship mission at NASA. Yeah. my, uh, my my argument would be this thing doesn't cost 10 million, uh, 10 billion, it doesn't. Exactly. So what is if if NASA would then collaborate with us and and make our <laughs> bigger? That's that's what I what I was going. Excellent. Yeah, I, I think they would be they would be very happy to contribute to a certain level. They will not give up on their flagship. Then no, I don't no, think no, this no, is no, definitely not. No. No. no, but I think that, that you could envision a, a scheme where we are contributing to their and they're contributing to ours. I think this is actually realistic, yes. Okay. Okay, uh, let's go for some other questions as well. And, and um, I saw Christiana wanted to ask a question, but now I think she's about to leave. Are, are you still there, Christiana? You want to still shoot? Yeah, I'm, I'm still there. I can at least place it and Sasha, we can discuss this later or whenever time um, allows. Um, I was wondering how you organize or not uh, the, the science background. So to me, it, it looks um, like a, a huge amount of enthusiasm and initiative, uh, but to um, it would be wonderful to see, as you already alluded to, 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 to see uh, more science angles, uh, directions being dragged in. Is there any any idea how to how to do this, how to organize this, or is this more kind of you know, um, um, developing in the background, hoping that it um, uh, that it converges at some point? 
it's, it's, it's a mixture of the two. I believe for the time being, it's very bottom up. As I said, everyone is invited to contribute. We have the science team where individual ideas are exchanged, different papers are on the pipeline. It's really open, everyone can contribute. But at the same time, we have to have a certain structure also on the political side that we you know, identify also the right questions that we should address, identify mm -hmm. also potential partners that could contribute. And this is what we currently started doing uh, what we start doing to uh, before the summer break. And this is what mm -hmm. we will have to continue. So we have contacts in different countries also expressing certain scientific interests, but it's not yet at a stage where it's systematic enough to really do that. This is, I think, one of the main tasks I will have in the coming, let's say, year or two years to really make sure we have sort of a, I don't want to call it a consortium that looks too rigid, but, you know, like a real a network where you can also then talk about the different scientific angles, as you said, and make sure they are represented. Okay, thank you. I really need to go now. Thanks for see, uh, to, to join us today. Bye. Thanks, Christiana. Okay, we still have uh, time for questions. So people, if you want to come forward, raise your hand. I, I take the opportunity to ask maybe a few more scientific questions. Um, I wanted to know about this detection phase. So you said, well, you are actually looking not necessarily on transiting planets, but on, on just orbiting planets. So is there any idea, would, would that be feasible to do this from ground maybe, and then, then shoot up the target list to, to, to life? Or do you need actually a phase operating life just to looking for useful targets? And how would you do that? Um, at this point in time, the, the best chances from the ground are the radio velocity machines. And the question is, do they reach the precision that is needed to find those terrestrial plants in the habitable zone around the G stars. Um, there are several projects that are currently started, that recently started or will start very soon to really also do a systematic search for plants around in the solar neighborhood. Many of the surveys that have, they have a target list that is, you know, goes out to 50, 60 parsec. This is not gonna work for any of the large missions I was mentioning. It has to be within 20, 20 parsec, maybe 25. Mm -hmm. So there are attempts, but even the radio velocity experts, they are challenging or, or questioning whether they reach the required precision. And if not, they still provide some very important limits on what kind of planets are there around those stars. And this is also something to keep in mind if you were to do a search phase. So if they don't succeed, you cannot have any other transits not gonna work. The direct imaging from the ground is not gonna work. So you have to then invest uh, in, in a search phase for these missions. And then you we can run simulations, you know, with a similar to, to the ones I, I, where I showed the results. You would look at the nearby stars, you would fold in some priors, which stars it would give higher priority than others, and then go and stare and spend some time until you reach a certain sensitivity limit that would allow you to identify those planets. And then you go to the next star and you do this for two years to populate a potential target list. And then in very longish discussions, you have to decide which of those planets you're gonna follow up in a second mission phase getting high, high signal to high spectrum. So if you want to avoid this, could you also just use the transiting planets or are they actually not, not useful targets for you? None of them is useful, unfortunately. The, the, they are too far away, even, well, it depends. Trappist is 13 parsec, I believe. This is already very difficult. It's not impossible, but it costs you a lot of telescope time. And this is the best system that we have these days. So simply because most plants do not transit, we don't have so many transiting, uh, uh, we don't have the great targets available from transits. The known planets from radio velocity, there are several within 10 parsecs. So we have a list to start with, but they are not necessarily the, the best ones. If you think again about terrestrial habitable planets, there's a decent number of super earth, there's a decent number of Neptunes. So you can start somewhere. If you wanna be very sure you start with this list and you don't search, but transiting planets, I'm very sorry. Okay, we have another question from Hans. Hans, do you want to ask your question yourself? I see it in the chat. It's about technology. Ah, let me so, see. So maybe you can read the question. Ah, yeah. Well, I don't know. Basically, Hans Eichelberger asks, if you shrink the photonics, would QSATs be feasible solution? So we're actually just discussing a potential precursor mission uh, with exactly this, this, this in mind, that you use um, a precursor mission, a small CubeSat style mission to develop some technologies and then you do a, a, a proof of principle of the measuring concept. So I believe a small, I'm not sure, I'm not sure you can go to a cube, 
but as I said, maybe shoebox size, maybe a little bit bigger. For the beam combiner, I think this is feasible. For the collector spacecraft, I fear this is not going to be feasible because you need to have a certain collecting areas to really get sufficient photons from the planet. So while you can shrink uh, the while you can shrink the the beam combiner and hopefully increasing instrument throughput, at the end of the day, you have to make sure that the collecting area provided by the collector spacecraft is sufficient, is large enough for those low photon rates to to be detectable. So this is going to be trade off between instrument throughput and aperture size that we haven't fully done yet. Um, but I don't think you can shrink the apertures to anything smaller than, let's say, 1, 1 1.5 meters. At this point in time, the baseline is 2 meters, where we would feel comfortable with. Um, but of course, um, the, the, the bigger, the better, the higher the signal to noise. Um, it might be, however, very interesting to, when you say you, you only then go for uh, solar planets also to that that you can live with with much smaller setup but i think you would learn a lot and i think you would also be then able to demonstrate that this concept all the problems you mentioned that they are in reach to be solved right so i think this is actually a, a not so not such a bad idea no not at all and, and and this is why this idea of a precursor mission is, is really getting more and more traction also within this life initiative and also in talking to various colleagues the question then really is how much science do we want this mission to deliver and how much is it really a pure technology demonstrator and this is a difficult trade-off because the moment you're going to do unique science it's going to be very very quickly very very costly with a simple argument being that anything related to sensitivity you have no chance in competing with james webb Anything related to spatial resolution, you have no chance in competing with ELT and METIS from the ground. So, and then finding a sweet spot where it's truly unique and still feasible and not too expensive. That's really, really tricky. I'm not saying it's impossible. We thought about this already a little bit, but it's gonna be difficult to find the right niche. And this is why at this point in time, we were more, we were more inclined towards giving more emphasis on the technology, as you said, demonstrating that you could do the photonic ship, that you can do the snarling interferometry in space and not put too much emphasis on the scientific output with an eye on the budget that such a mission would then need or require. But it's a very, very interesting discussion. We just started doing that and let's see where we're gonna be in let's say six or 12 months from now. Okay, are there any other questions? Yes. Another one from Luca, please. I have I have a super quick question. Um, what are you what are your your estimates for exposure times typically? Just to days to week. Yeah, day, days to weeks. So um, the detection mm -hmm. phase is typically in, of order, let's say I don't know, 20, 24 hours depends a little bit. The characterization that you know, if you take the Earth twin at 10 parsec, that's gonna be of order, you know, three, four weeks integration time. Okay. So. And it, 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 yeah, it's long. Of course, it, it, it puts very strong requirements on the stability of the system. Exactly. Of course, you would read out and repoint, re but this is at the moment what, what it will be very difficult to get away from, from such long exposure times, unless you, you, know, you really increase the apertures to even larger than what we're currently considering, which is two to three meters. Okay, thank you. Maybe very quick, very last question from myself. Um, is there any science case for solar planets? So I think we had Aki Robert here uh, presenting Habex uh, concept, and I think she also said, or she she, she had some, you know, fantastic uh, outlook on on yeah observing some of of uh, I don't know I think it was was a Titan or what, and, and with a really high resolution, so you could see all the details. Is there anything in for for solar planets or moons? We didn't look into this at all at this point in time. We just saw the beautiful images that James Webb published. You know, there's amazing information available. Of course, they could then maybe increase the, the spatial resolution, but then it becomes very difficult very quickly because then it's really about image and reconstruction, right? So remember, we have an, you have an interferometer and this nitty gritty details with the bands and the, and the, and the, and the winds and so on. That's going to be very difficult to pull out from interfer interferometric measurement. So this is why at this point in time, we didn't really focus uh, on this at all. It's also going to be, I have to think about this, you know, it's an L2 looking back. So maybe there's a case, but it's certainly not the strongest case apart from making beautiful images. I think there's other ways also from the ground and with James Webb, where I could probably do 
you know, a significant part of this already. And then the delta, I believe, is a little bit smaller than maybe for a reflected light mission. Okay, Sasha. Thank you so much. Uh, congratulations again for this fantastic talk. I enjoyed it a lot. And I will stop the recording.